I will be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. I know that was a really long scripture reading. It is a, an indicator of things to come. I promise to be fairly brief today and not keep you too long. Um, I just want to thank you for being here today and singing the way that you have because you've really encouraged me. When I hear you lifting up your voices the way that you do, it just it brings a lot of encouragement and joy to my heart to hear that many people that want to lift their voices to the Lord in praise, to bring honor and glory to him in the way that they live. So I'm going to share a little bit of an unusual lesson with you today, but hopefully not too unusual that you'll walk away thoroughly confused. One of the things that I do as a youth minister is I teach a little bit. I may teach a class or two during the week, studying with different people, and since that's something that I do so often, I'm constantly looking at how I can communicate better to people. How can I communicate in a way that they're going to understand God's word better? And as a result of that passion and that constant goal, I find myself looking at different teaching styles of individuals, specifically within Scripture. And there's a lot of different teaching styles that you can find throughout Scripture. Paul has a whole bunch of them, different tools and techniques that he uses to try and help his audience to understand what he's communicating. If you look in Acts 17, it has several examples just right there without even digging too far. The first one that Paul uses in Acts chapter 17 and verse 2, he finds himself at the church of Thessalonica, and it says in verse 2, Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So the first technique that we see from Paul is that he goes in, he takes the scriptures, and he sits down and he uses logic and understanding to try and explain to them, this is what it looks like to follow God, this is what it means to be his follower, this is why Jesus' death meant something. So that's one technique. If you skim down to verse 22, when he's in Athens, he uses a little bit different technique. I like to call it the compliment sandwich. People respond well to flattery and compliments, and Paul uses the exact same concept. In verse 22, it says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Aeropagus, I never know how to pronounce that one, Men of Athens, I perceive that you, that in every way you are very religious. So he comes in and he butters them up a little bit, and he says, I see that you want to know about God. And the funny thing is, as we look throughout Scripture, we can see this technique used a lot. Like, if you look at the greetings of most letters within the Bible, I mean, for instance, you go to the book of Luke, and how does it start out? It says, most excellent Theophilus. Now, most excellent could have been a title, but he also chose to use the title as a sign of respect and everything else. He's trying to warm his audience up to him. You see him when he writes to Timothy. He says to Timothy, my true child in the faith. So this isn't anything unusual. We all use that technique, and preachers use this a lot because if you compliment someone and they feel relaxed and they let their guard down, they're more likely to respond positively to what you're saying. Hence, maybe some compliments that I gave you. Another tool that preachers like to use is making you laugh, because when you laugh, your guard is lowered. So you see a lot of preachers that like to tell a joke at the beginning of their sermon just to relax you and make you more receptive to the word. So these are all kinds of tools that are used. Paul uses another one in verse 23 that I like to call mystery or intrigue. So in verse 23, it says, For I, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And he goes on and he explains about who God is using something that they didn't understand, something to try and pique their interest and to get them thinking. The other part of that that I think is interesting that is a very clear echo of one of Jesus' most famous teaching styles is 
It's parable teaching. He's taking something earthly or something that they already understand maybe or something that they know about and he's trying to use it to relate a spiritual truth. So if we look throughout scripture, Jesus uses parable teaching over and over and over again. And I want to re-examine the idea of what a parable is. We've all heard this definition before. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, which is true. But I came across this definition about 10 years ago. There was a youth minister in Tennessee, his name's David Skidmore, and he shared with me a quote from some other much more intelligent than I gentlemen who created this quote talking about what a parable could be. And he put it this way. He said, a parable is a metaphor or a simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or its strangeness leaving the mind in sufficient doubt as to its precise application to tease the mind into active thought. And if we look at Jesus' parable teaching, almost every single time he taught a parable, he didn't just hand out the answer at the end of it. You constantly had a question of, okay, Jesus, what does that mean? Like, sure, the kingdom of heaven is like that, but... Explain this to me more fully. Why are we talking about gardening? And as a result, it would tease their minds into active thought. They would be asking themselves, what does this mean? And that's what I'm hoping to do with you today. I want to tease your mind into active thought so that you start asking the question of, who is God? What does it mean to follow him? And maybe, what should I be doing or what shouldn't I be doing? This is a teaching style that I like to use with our teens quite a lot. Uh, I do this about once a month is my goal. And I'll take a story or a song or a video clip from YouTube and we'll sit down and we'll try and figure out, okay, how does this relate to God? And I tell them a story and I ask them a few questions. The questions go like, what can I learn about God from this story? How will this help me understand a spiritual truth more fully? What scriptures in my mind go along with this story or this example or this illustration that can help me to grasp this picture more fully? So I'm going to try and do that today. I promise I'm not just going to have a story with no scripture. Bear with me. We will get to the scripture, but I'm just going to share with you a story of Clever Hans. So some of you, have anybody heard of Clever Hans before? There's a few, but not many. (laughs) Clever Hans is a horse. It's not a person in this picture. Uh, In about the early 1900s, there was a German man by the name of Herr von Osteen. And he had this horse, Hans, that he had trained to count by stamping his front foot hoof. And Hans was a really clever horse and learned very quickly, and before too long, he had Hans performing in front of audiences that were paying to see this horse count. It got even better because apparently Hans could do math. He could add, subtract, divide, multiply. He could do complicated mathematical equations, and people were absolutely amazed. He was so good, he could count the number of people in a room, He could tell you the number of people that were wearing eyeglasses simply by stamping his foot the appropriate number of times. So this amazed a lot of people, but probably like me, some of you are saying, yeah, that's got to be fake. There's always a skeptic. So they started devising tests to try and see if Hans actually could do these things. So they came up with a series of tests, and the first one that they did was they would not allow von Osteen to select the numbers in the equation. So it would be kind of like we see with our modern magicians. Can someone over here give me a number? Can someone over here give me a number? What would you like it to be? Divided, multiplied, added. And they would call these things out, and then Hans would start tapping his hoof and give the correct answer. So this convinced some of the skeptics, but not all. So as a result, they devised a second test. And the second test was one individual from the audience would come up and whisper in his right ear, and then another would come up and whisper in his left ear, and then he would be asked to add the two numbers together. 
Hans was unable to give the correct answer. So, what they were able to determine was, as long as someone in the audience that Hans could see knew the answer to the question, he could give the correct answer. So some of you may be thinking about this. I will give you the answer. I won't leave you hanging. The trick was the problem would be offered, and when the audience saw him start to stomp his foot, they would tense up and lean forward, expectantly waiting. And he would continue to stomp until the correct number was reached, and people's body language would relax, they would lean back, and they would start nodding. And that was Hans's cue to stop stamping his hoof. So Hans was a clever horse, maybe not on the level of Mr. Ed, but pretty, pretty fantastic. So what I want you to do is I want you to start thinking about this. Maybe you can jot some things down in your notes. What can you learn from the story of Clever Hans? Specifically, I want you to start thinking about a spiritual truth that this may illustrate. In what way are we like Clever Hans? In what way is God like Clever Hans? What's a scripture that comes to mind? Write those things down. I'm going to give you some of my thoughts, but when I do this with teenagers, they come up with far better answers than I do sometimes. And it's because they're engaged in creative thinking. And they can take something like a story of Clever Hans and go and tell their friends, and it gives them an opportunity to start a conversation about God. That's what parable teaching is. And that's what we're going to try and do today. So, Hans was a pretty smart horse, but he really wasn't able to do math. The key to Hans' abilities was reading people's body language, their actions, and based on what he would see, he would adjust his actions. Now, there's a few things in Scripture that this echoes for me. The first one is that Hans was really good at reading people in order to gain their approval. And you know what? I think that a lot of us do the same thing today. Whether it's on a conscious or a subconscious level, we adjust our behavior based on the actions of other people. Even if it's something as simple as, you know what? If I don't bite my tongue right now, I know me and this individual are going to be in an argument over something that's not really important. And we adjust our actions and we change it based on the body language and the tension that we read in that other person. However, some of us have taken this to an extreme that can become unhealthy. Where we say we're a Christian, and when we walk in the doors here, we act exactly how we know a Christian should. But then when we walk out those doors at the end of service, we become a completely different person. I worked as a mechanic for a number of years, and during that time, Shops can be rough places. I worked with one guy in particular who had one of the foulest mouths I have ever heard. Constantly, like, profanity was the adjective to every single situation. Like, I'm pretty sure that his vocabulary was broken because he didn't really have a good grasp of how to use adjectives. Foul jokes, sexist, racist, you name it. What was interesting was when his wife would visit him at work. She would walk in, and it was like a switch had been flipped. And he was a totally different person. And I was very curious about this, so I talked with her, and I talked with him, and it turns out that they went to church, and they were Christians. I would have never, ever guessed that based on the way that he was behaving. He was behaving totally different because of his surroundings. Because he was in a surrounding where the path of least resistance was blending in and looking like everyone else. We're not the only ones to struggle with this problem. This isn't anything that's new. We can find this exact situation in John chapter 12. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's done countless miracles. He has come into Jerusalem in a triumphal entry. He's even predicted his own death at this point. And yet, this is the response that some people have to Jesus' message. It says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. Great. That's awesome. But 
for fear they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Many people believed in Jesus, but because they were afraid of standing out, because they were afraid of acting differently, they chose to look at the leaders of their culture and their religious society and change their beliefs based on the way that other people were acting. You know what we call this when we see teenagers doing this? We call it peer pressure. And we say that's a teenage problem, but guess what? Adults struggle with this too. We call it keeping up with the Joneses. We call it a variety of different things. But we change our behavior based on the people that we're watching closely. So the question you have to ask yourself is, who am I watching so closely that I'm willing to compromise what I believe about Jesus, the way that I act, the way that I speak. And this leads me into what I think is our second thought that we can get from the story of Clever Hans and some scriptures that go along with it. What are you teaching with your actions? Clever Hans could figure out the correct answers to complex mathematical equations simply by watching people. If someone were to watch you as closely as Hans watched his audience, what do you think they would discover? Specifically, what do you think they would learn about what it means to follow Christ? Because whether we want to admit it or not, people are watching And we don't have to say a word about who Christ is or what it means to follow him because if his death on that cross truly means something to us, our life is going to look different. If your baptism truly frees you from sin, your life is going to show it. If you have peace because you have a God that you can pray to and your prayers are heard, your life will look different. Let people know what kind of a difference he's made in your life. All you have to do is live it. This is a quote probably most of you have heard. A man by the name of Francis made it and he said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. We laugh because it's clever, but it is true. We are constantly proclaiming who Christ is, whether people know we're a Christian or not. We are giving a message. Our actions and our body language, our nonverbal communication, often do the talking for us. And when our actions and the things that we do do not line up with the words and the things that we say, the actions are going to win out every time. People are going to listen to what our feet are saying. Uh, A friend of mine who's a preacher, he constantly would say this, people vote with their feet. What they do, where they go, where they spend their time. That determines what is of value, what is important. So we need to live in such a way that when people study us, they will really know who Jesus is. They'll understand what it means to be a follower of his. Samuel read our super long verse earlier. This really ties a neat and tidy bow on the story of Clever Hans, doesn't it? Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul is saying, look at how I follow God and follow him. That's what we should be doing as Christians. We need to live in a way that people get who God is. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. We are called to model Christ so that people will know what God looks like. Guess what? Jesus struggled with his own disciples getting this very concept. Even though they had been with him for a long time, there were still things like this. John 14, it says, Jesus said to him, have you been with me so long and still do not know me, Philip? Whosoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us who the Father is? 
Back in John 13, Jesus tells his disciples, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Our actions are proclaiming who Christ is. We are teaching people who God is by the way that we act. So when we say that we want to love and forgive as God does, yet we find ourselves keeping records of wrong, our actions are saying something different. When we say that we love our enemies, yet we don't really help our neighbors. When we say that we want to share the gospel with every single person, when we choose to engage in battles on Facebook over political issues that we feel have moral righteousness behind them. Yet, we have a hard time saying hello to a stranger in our church building. I'm going to offer an invitation in just a minute, and I'm going to preface it now. We'll sing a song. If you have a need, if this message has touched you, if you're just struggling and you need the church's support, in a minute we're going to sing a song, and I want to invite you to come and feel the blessings that the church has to offer with the support that it can bring. I want to leave you with a few closing thoughts when it comes to Clever Hans. My hope is that the story of Hans can tease your mind into active thought. My hope is that this story, may it cause you to reflect upon your life and your actions. May this story trigger in you something that brings to mind a scripture, a truth about who God is, that will challenge you, change you, and transform you. The question that I want to leave you with for the week to ask yourself is this. People are watching you closely. What are you teaching? My heart, my mind, my body, 